Hello, this is Minder Chen. Let's talk about market sizing in the context of entrepreneurship. We started with a story of Zappos. Zappos was kind of conceived, the concept of selling shoes online was conceived in 1998 when Nick Swimmer, um, who was Leading in Bay Area, San Francisco, uh, was looking for a pair of Airwalk. Uh, this is actually, I think, the the pair of shoes he was looking for here. Um, but he couldn't find the right one, the right size and style. Uh, after I think went through four different store, so he was really frustrated and. Uh, decided that maybe there's an opportunity to build a website to sell in shoes online. Um, Nick has some experience of working in the in internet industry. Um, he worked for a firm called AutoWeb who that sell insurance online. And however, selling shoes is a different matter. It's a physical object and here at the bottom here you see a picture of his kind of pitching slide deck and uh, for instance he kind of argued there's a pool service and it has higher search costs for people who are looking for a special kind of brand of shoes and so it was very frustrated and, and therefore he um, came up with the idea of selling shoes online and, and his idea would uh, eventually became uh, Zeppo um, as we know it. Uh, Zeppo um, is a very successful online kind of shoes selling website. Um, and certainly Zeppos nowadays are selling more than um, shoes. So after he came up with the idea, um, he realized he need the money to, to start um, kind of building the website. And he called around different venture capital firms uh, and nobody seems to be interested in um, selling shoes online, which is kind of um, a new things, even uh, at uh, around 1999. Uh, however, he left uh, actually um, a message at a small venture firm called Venture Frogs. And in, in his answering machine message he left uh, with Venture Frog, he kind of, at the, towards the very end, he mentioned that uh, shoes market is really big, it's about um, $40 billion. And actually, 5% of the shoes were sold uh, through mail order. If, if you think about it, mail order and, and online business uh, or e-commerce through, uh, through website, they're very similar in a way that um, we cannot actually try shoes before we buy it. Uh, either mail order or online purchase. Okay, I, I believe that's kind of the main reason a lot of people has doubt in terms of the potential f opportunity or success for selling shoes online because most of people would like to try it on um, before they buy it. Uh, so the online model doesn't seem to work. But here's the proof. Um, there are people who are buying shoes through mail order, which means they they did not have chance to try it on before uh, before they bought the shoes. So, um, so this actually get the attention of um, venture frogs uh, investor uh, because even five percent of um, is a small percentage, but the pie is forty billion. So that actually we're talking about two billion dollars market. Uh, and certainly the conceived new business may not capture that 
two billion dollars market, but if they can get certain percentage of it, that could be still quite significant. So let's do a little bit calculation. First, we call it total available market is for shoes is forty billion dollars. And second, uh, the serve we call it serve addressable market, SAM. The size is five percent of the ten, which is two billion dollars in this case. And let's use share of the market for this new startup, or sometimes we call it target market, and assume it can reach ten percent of the um serve addressable market in two years then the revenue uh, at the end of the two year would be uh, 200 million dollars okay typically uh, based on my understanding vc venture capital firms uh, they they would not be interested in any startup business um, if the potential uh, size of the market at least for the venture capital firm is less than a hundred million dollars so 200 million is not a bad thing um, and because of that venture frogs uh, decided to invest in this firm um, and, and Nick was saying that at that time when he received um, that half a million investment um, he was so delighted if he felt that it seems that he raise about a hundred million um, dollars so however there's a string attached to to the venture frogs investment a uh, venture frog um, demand that uh, Nick found someone who really know the shoes business um, so they're lucky enough to hire Fred uh, Mosler, who used to work at Nostrum uh, in their shoes department, in charge of uh, purchasing, sometimes we call it buyer. And uh, so he came on board as a senior vice president of merchandising. Um, this request implied that the understanding of the industry of the domain was that domain knowledge is really an important uh, critical success factor. So as an entrepreneur, um, if you're interested in certain industry, uh, you better um, educate yourself to have um, really in-depth knowledge of the industry. It will help you to convince the investors and also to help you to be more successful. And that's kind of um shift a little bit to talk about the current Zappos CEO, which is Tony Shea, who was actually the investor uh, from Venture Frogs. Uh, Efri Lin, uh, who was also a partner at Venture Frogs. Um, the, the two were um, study at Harvard as undergraduate students and uh, and effort uh, since um, work was Tony and the, together I think they work at a firm called Link Exchange that uh, Tony founded. Um, they, um, they sold the company to Microsoft for about 256 million dollars and Tony Shed actually pocketed about 40 million dollars and Effrey I think also earned some um, money uh, when they exit the link exchange which is exchanging advertised ads uh, among their website um, and this is actually by the way the Zappos office um, they, um, they they shoot this picture in front of their desk uh, it's just like a typical uh, cubicle uh, like any other employee so Zappos has a very flat and kind of cultures and easygoing cultures you can tell um, and anyway so um, 
make a long story short, Tani was investors and eventually uh, decided to um, to get involved in administration, became the co-CEO and eventually became the CEO when Nick uh, decided to um, to kind of leave Zeppo, so Tony become the only CEO until now. And Zeppo was sold to Amazon around 2009 for about $1.2 billion. Uh, so in about 10 years, um, they, they, they grew to about $1.2 billion in, in its market size. So if, if you really compare the number, um, the estimation, although here our estimation is in two years, it will be 200 million, but in 10 years, um, we grow, for instance, in about five times um, after the second year. Uh, that's not bad, okay? It's, it's a pretty good investment. But how did um, this Tony and Alfred um, kind of knew each other? It's kind of an interest, interesting story. And, and this picture kind of tells um, a little bit uh, what's behind the story. Uh, Tony was running a little pizza kind of place um, at Harvard on um, Harvard campus, and and Alfred is was one of his um, biggest customer. Uh, he can frequently buying pizza, sometimes um, more than one, sometimes come back uh, the second trip uh, in very short period of time. So Tony was kind of curious, I mean, are, are, are you throwing party all the time or are you eating a lot? And eventually figured out that Alfred was actually um, uh, divide the pizza up into like eight pieces and selling each piece for $2. And, and the whole pizza, uh, for instance, is say $10. So actually Alfred's profit margin is, um, is actually uh, pretty, pretty decent. Um, it's, it's about 60% um, profit margin, uh, probably more than Tony's um, profit margin for running the pizza place. So he, hey, this guy is a really smart guy, uh, doing not much but making more money than I am. Uh, and so he kind of, um, eventually they became friends and appreciate each other's uh, kind of business talent. So that's the story, and the story tells us a little bit about, um, if you're thinking about, let's go back a little bit, if you're thinking about uh, how uh, Nick was pitching his business to venture capital firm, uh, he pretty much has to give a top-down estimation of the market size, the total available market, and then due to the limitation, the channel, um, the geographical limitation, then you narrow it down to a so-called serve addressable market. And since at the very beginning when you start a business, you want to be very focused, um, a, probably a much narrowed um, segment. Uh, therefore, uh, we have something called target market or share of the market for the startup. So we're going to explain this concept uh, in a little bit more detail and and so let's continue. And let's kind of review a little bit of entrepreneurship. Um, entrepreneurship is about creating a new ventures. Um, we call it startup. And you need to have entrepreneurial thinking and have a value creation mindset. And in certain, this is applicable to company of all sizes, but particularly uh, applicable to start a business. Uh, traditionally defined entre entrepreneurship um, in, in terms of just starting a small business or building new product or try to reduce costs, etc. However, a modern and broader definition is that entrepreneurship is the process of identifying an opportunity and regardless of the resource currently available. And so opportunity identification becomes a very important um, 
aspect of entrepreneurship. And once you identify opportunity, you may not have all the resources, but if you're creative enough uh, through networking or other way, you may be able to marshal enough resources to help you to pursue the opportunity that you have identified. So to some extent, entrepreneurship is a way of thinking and acting um, that is really um, opportunity obsessed. And we, it's a really a holistic approach. And you need to find balance among um, several critical factors. So to understand entrepreneurship, we need to understand um, what is uh, value or value add, how you add value. And, and when you say value, um, you have to refer to who are you talking about. Those are the stakeholders. So what is the value and for whom? And stakeholder could be uh, your customer, your investor, your supplier, your employee, the community you serve, and the funding team who created the um, startup firm in the first place. And you may um, acquire some IP from a university, research lab, or, or other uh, owner of the IP. And you have to deal with them as well. So, in as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur, you try to start a business. So you're looking for opportunity, and eventually you are an integrator. You integrate a lot of resources, talents, and together to pursue opportunity. So uh, you become a leaders uh, of the firms. Um, there are so many factors you need to take care of all at once, so try to keep uh, balance in various aspects is important as an entrepreneur. And, but the whole purpose is actually try to, is to create value for your stakeholders. Here's a little um, statistic from Global Entrepreneurship Monitors report uh, in 2004. So any, it said that at any given time, about 12% of the U.S. adult population is involved in entrepreneurial activity, planning to start a venture or currently managing a business less than uh, 42 months old. Um, we covered Timmons model before. Here's just a quick review because we're going to uh, use this a little bit uh, down the road. Uh, Timman consider opportunity team and resources. Opportunity teams and resource are the three critical factors available to an entrepreneur. And the success of entrepreneur depends on his or her ability to balance these three key critical factors. And on the opportunity side is how you identify and evaluate opportunity. Uh, that's really our main topics today when we talk about market sizing. And second is to how you marshal the resources or gather, aggregate the resource and use the resource to pursue the activity. And the third is entrepreneurial uh, teams, members and the formation of the team. And when an entrepreneur pursuing a startup opportunity, um, we, we have a kind of preconceived notion that they are um, extreme risk taker. However, that's true, but not totally true. Um, because entrepreneur are um, people who kind of pursue opportunity. So they uh, behave in a way that has some degree of spontaneity and also considered to be opportunism uh, or opportunist. Um, but at the same time, a successful experienced entrepreneurs uh, are very disciplined and they do follow certain process or methodology uh, to pursue um, his dream 
And so, yes, they are risk taker, but uh, they are highly calculated in their risk taking adventure. So this seems to be uh, spontaneity, opportunism, and discipline and process seems to be conflicting with each other. But a, but an experienced entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur, seems to be able to integrate the two uh, together, just like Tai Chi, um, which has yin and yang, and can integrate the yin and yang in this holistic Tai Chi and, and find the right balance. I think that's really the secret source uh, for the success of um, an entrepreneur. And we're going to discuss the kind of three M's framework. Uh, this is really based on uh, a Baptist document, which we'll point it out later. Uh, the first one, uh, this framework is used for us to assess the opportunity that we may have identified. The one certain is the market demand. Is, is there a true market demand um, for uh, for the opportunity that you have identified, and the second is that how big is the market? Okay, how strong is the demand? Translate into how big is the market? The market size and the structure of the market. Okay, and and the third is to to analyze the margin, the potential margin. Okay, margin is hard to get that number right away, but you need to have some idea about the cost for you to produce your product or offering the service and the the pricing, how much you can charge for that. And that would allow you to get some idea about the margin. And so that's we that's what we refer to as a margin uh, analysis. Okay. And <clears throat> so this is the document that I'm, I was referring to a little bit earlier. It's from a Babson's uh, talking about the Babson entrepreneurships. Um, you're strong, strongly encouraged to get a copy of this document and study yourself. So let's kind of drill down the three m's um market demand identify target audience who are your target customers consider durability of product how long your product will last uh, is it just a, a fade or it will become fashionable and become classic become something people would love and use for a long time and how can you reach out to your customer um, is it a regional business, national business, or the worldwide business? And also based on your pricing and the value propositions, uh, what would be the customer's perception of the price value relationship? So that's for the market demand, for the market size and structures. Uh, is this an emerging market or it's kind of fragmented market? If it's a fragmented market, then you may find a niche that other people ignore. If it's an emerging market, it, it presents a great opportunity at the same time that uh, since it's new, uh, you, your challenge may be educating the consumer. You also need to look at whether there's a proprietary barrier. Uh, someone may hold a critical intellectual property um, that may prohibit you from entering the market. And you also want to know what stage of the product cycle uh, that, that you're on uh, in terms of the product you try to sell, product or service you try to sell. If the product is towards the end of its product cycle, then it may not make a lot of sense for you to get in. Unless you have a new idea to renew the product to launch a, a new product cycle, an updated renew product cycle. Margin analysis, you need to identify the strengths of the, the venture. Uh, because if, if you do have the strengths of really high demand, you can probably raise your price and eventually increase your profit margins. 
and you need to understand a little bit of competition because if you have um, a lot of competition your margin probably will be dragged down and and for its established firm you want to see when there this um, new products uh, venture uh, will have some impact to your corporate price earning ratio okay if you're successful the price earning ratio may may look good so first is to gouge or estimate the market demand uh, we want to start with uh, the market share and potential market share and the gross potential um, for startup firm, we really want to see that um, the idea that you have is not only has the demand uh, profitable, but also scalable. Okay. And McDonald's founder Ray Kroc uh, was fond of describing the organization as green and growing, or ripe and rotting. And definitely we want to be the green and growing one. Uh, and by the way, there is actually an uh, interesting documentary, which I have a link here, um, on McDonald's history. Uh, I believe in 2006, there's also a, uh, there's also a, a movie, I believe it's called The Founder, which is really um, about McDonald. Uh, you're welcome to check it out. So in order to gouge the market demand, you need to identify the target audience. Um, and if the market has high demand and has the gross potential, and that's what we separate an entrepreneurial business from a small business, is the gross potential, as we mentioned. Okay. You can run a pretty small, successful business, uh, such as a burger joint, a small fast food store, standalone. Okay, and but that's not particularly considered a interesting startup business or an entrepreneurial business because unless you can, like McDonald, um, to view the um, chain store. Uh, and franchise business, uh, you're going to stay as that small business forever. And so there's really no major growth potential. You want to identify reachability of your customer, your reachability to your customer, and or the channel accessibility. Can you go through the distributed channel to sell your product services? Can you build your own e-commerce website? Can you use like Amazon to sell your product and services? And you also need to consider that uh, the market demand um, somewhat is demanded by the investor because they have some expected return that they want to get out of their investment. And last, we mentioned that customer perception of the price value relationship is important, which means that your product service better has really good value add. Uh, to to, um, to the target customer. Why the market size is important? Um, because venture capitalists are interested in knowing the market size. If the market size is too small, they don't usually have any interest in investing. And and because of that, as we mentioned. Scaling growth potential. Here we refer to a scaling strategy is important. Allow you to eventually capture a bigger market. However, we have to emphasize. However, you need to start in a more niche market, a more focused, narrowed market segment. And if we use kind of business strategies term, it's really you need to have a more focused strategy. So I summarize this as focus first and then scale. Focus first and become successful. Um, you basically establish a successful um, pitch head. And then uh, you're able to scale based on that um, success. And that's the secret. 
In terms of market size, we also need to look at a little bit about the product life cycle uh, because if, if the product is in the high growth early stage, then the market you're in um, has a lot of potential. If you already, if the product is already in the maturity and stability stage, then it is not very attractive. And also at this stage, you probably has a lot of ex, um, existing rivalry in the same industry producing similar products and services. So your profit margin probably will not be very high unless you come up with some breakthrough. If it's in the really, really early stage, you may be the first mover, but educating the consumers and try to figure out some of the technology related challenge uh, can be um, can be daunting okay. but understanding your product life cycle is uh, important to reflect on the market size and structure so the last of the three M's um, is margin analysis Margin analysis to identify the strengths of the ventures. Um, it is really a financial measures um, of your competitive advantage. If you can demand a higher profit margin than actually your competitor, then you're very competitive um, because customers love your product and service and willing to pay a premium um, to, to buy your product or um, to enjoy your service. And this certainly will help you uh, in terms of your price um, earning uh, ratio. So what differentiate ideas from opportunity? Uh, you want to ask yourself, is your product service is this the best? And, um, and also, uh, can, do you have a lower cost? Okay, so you become the cost um, low cost leadership in competition and how about your gross margin comparing to others in the same industry and eventually you want to ask that um, what your venture will be um, broke e broken even okay. and usually the VC um, would like to have a business break even in about one to two or three years. So let's continue just a little bit um, to expand on the market sizing. Uh, since you, you want to estimate the market size, the first thing is you need to understand the market. The market is the customer and potential customers who purchase specific product service from, from you as a startup firm. The market segment is a process of dividing a broader consumer and business market and which has existing or potential customer into subgroup of consumer. Um, they're known as segment. And, and the different segment has different, uh, the customer in different segment has some shared um, attribute or characteristic. The market segment can help a firm to focus um, on the certain segment in which they have competitive advantage. A market can be segmented by its geographical region, uh, the demographics of its customer, um, by the pricing range, and certainly we can say by its value and price kind of metrics as well as the different channel that they may use. So if we look at market segmentations um, on the customer side, uh, we try to divide the whole market into various segments. And once we identify all the possible segments, then we need to actually target certain segments. However, when we talk about target particular segment, we have to come to the right-hand side of this diagram which is we have to decide it on a value proposition which can help us to position our product and service to the target segment. 
and to decide on the value proposition to some extent we most likely try to differentiate us from other competitors product and offering and so the market segment um, the targeting um, segmentation targeting and positioning are the kind of three-step process um, in in identifying the value proposition and matching or fitting the market segment that we have in mind so this is to some extent as we discussed previously it's a little bit of product market fit so this is kind of market side this is the product side so we try to find the right product market fit to create value for our target customer this is just a detail how we may further um, segmenting the consumer market based on demographic, based on the psychographic, um, like lifestyles, personality of an individual. It could be segmented by geographics, region, um, and also some behavior attributes um, that we can use all of this uh, in our segmentation. We mentioned the um, the approach that we're introducing here um, that is referring to as STP is market segmentation here with S targeting select the right market segment which is the target market and eventually positioning positioning is referring to the product that is presented for the target market and then you can decide it on the optimal um, marketing mix or product mix um, to a number of segments, uh, a number of product and offering, and to meet the market's um, demand. So to some extent, the STP approach is really a divide, conquer approach, but it's divide and conquer with your product and service. Divide. Divide the market up into segments. Conquer. Conquer means target certain segment um, to enter or to attack. And product positioning, which means based on your, your product um, strengths, and characteristic the technology that you um, that you have deployed and you try to position your product to conquer the target market that's the product positioning and positioning certainly can be um, another area that we can uh, explore further but we're going to kind of just highlight that positioning is really to, uh, try to identify a set of possible competitive advantage to build a position, which means product position, by provide secure value. Uh, the value is from your product, from your service, and we need to also think about the, the marketing channel we want to use and the people, the customer we want to reach out, and also the product image. Uh, that you want to establish. Okay, so this is just in general about product positioning. Okay, um, so we will, I'll stop here and we will continue to actually uh, drill down on the market sizing issues uh, in the next segment. Thank you.